everyone's got their sound issues um, figured out. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, if not, um, I guess uh, leave a note in the chat box and Kari and Tom will be on it. Um, my name is Michelle Weisbrook. I am um, an extension specialist in pesticide safety education um, here on campus and then um, uh, weed science is also my specialty as well. So um, today um, I've been asked to talk about practical weed control and so um, I want to just um, go over some basics of weed control and um, share some um, hopefully practical and helpful um, tips for you as well in dealing with your garden weeds. So for starters, what is a weed? Um, a weed is essentially a, a plant that's growing out of place and um, we find that um, a lot of times it uh, really depends on where the plant is growing um, more so than you know what species of, of plant it is. Um, and uh, Barbara Pleasant says that uh, weeds are any plants that insist on growing where you don't want them to grow and I think that's a pretty good definition. Um, sometimes we have plants that um, you know you may have two people look at it and you get differing opinions as to whether it's a desirable plant or whether it is a weed. Um, and uh, just a few examples of those, um, certainly uh, morning glories, um, amaranthus, and actually in the picture here, um, all those maroon colored plants, um, those all started from one little pot that I was given um, as a, it was a free plant, and, and it was a desirable, you know, and I planted it, and it didn't take long for it to take over and, and kind of, uh, have weedy tendencies. So that a lot of time is the bottom line when you are determining whether or not to control something is, um, is it going to take over? Okay, so why control weeds? Well, we have many reasons, of course, why we might want to. Um, certainly weeds can um, change the appearance of our landscapes, make them look somewhat ragged. Um, weeds can also um, provide unwanted competition for sunlight, water, nutrients, space, and um, so many reasons to, to control them right there. Um, and some species are pretty invasive. You know, they will take over an area very quickly. Um, they can establish themselves, um, produce a lot of seed, and um, really make your garden their home in no time flat. Other reasons, weeds can um, harbor insect and disease pests, and certainly many of them may pose a health hazard to humans as well. Um, we know that uh, pollen from, say, the ragweeds um, can cause a lot of health issues. Many folks are allergic to the pollen. Um, also, uh, sometimes plants will have um, a sap that can cause um, blisters to the skin. Um, uh, wild parsnip comes to mind. Um, certainly poison ivy can cause a lot of issues as well. So many reasons why we want to control weeds. Um, and of course it's really important um, that you, um, when you set out to control your weeds, that they, you control them before they set seed. Um, this of course will save yourself a lot of future weed problems, a lot of headaches. Um, so just a, um, a little bit of data here that um, was uh, compiled by Michigan State University. And um, the first number there, um, and looks like the lot lighter colored font, um, is the number of seeds per plant. And um, some of these certainly can produce a lot, a lot of seeds. You know, even common lamb's quarters there, it's 72,500 seeds. That's one, you know, that's a lot of seeds for one plant. And it's a summer annual plant. Now, the numbers in the parentheses there are um, um, what they found. That was the number of years that it would take um, to see a 99% reduction in the number of seed. So if they let um, a weed go ahead and produce seed, the seeds fall to the ground, blow in the wind, whatever, 
Um, and then, you know, microbes feed on those seeds or mice or, you know, other predators. How long would it take for those seeds to essentially go away and no longer be viable there in the soil and be an issue? And for some of these seeds, we're looking at a really long life. Um, common land squirts, they're again, 78 years, velvet leaf, 56 years, you know. So um, uh, if you let that one little velvet leaf plant go to seed, um, you can certain, certainly set yourself up for many, many years of weeding down the road. Um, so, you know, just as we have... Um, just as we have different styles of gardens, we also have, uh, it seems, um, varying attitudes of gardeners, you know, when it comes to weed control. And so um, one time I decided to interview some local gardeners and get their take on gardening. And I found um, there were varying, I mean, vast differences from gardener to gardener. Um, one gardener I talked to said that she sprays Roundup weekly. Um, she does not trust the preventer herbicides. And so Roundup, if you recall, it's a non-selective herbicide and it's used to control weeds that have already emerged from the soil. Um, so that's, I mean, that's dedication. That's, you know, weekly she's out there spraying. Another said she swears by preen, which is a preventer herbicide, prevents the weeds from emerging from the soil, and she does that about twice a year. Uh, another said they use a lot of mulch. Another said they use no mulch um, for one reason or another. Um, certainly mulch, um, they said, can um, harbor a uh, pest, um, certainly provides food and cover for slugs was her big worry. Um, another said they had a lot of flooding and mulch can, you know, be really messy to deal with when they have flooding in their gardens. Another said that um, they really like to crowd their ornamentals together, um, which you know, if you have a bed full of ornamentals, you don't have a lot of room for weeds, which is an interesting tactic. Um, another said um, kind of the same thing, except a little different. They rely a lot on self-seeding annuals to fill in those open spots. Um, another said that they enjoy planting vegetables in with their flowers, and so that way they're more enjoyable to read around or to weed around. And then also they can snack along the way when they're out there weeding. Um, and I've also heard of people who will snack on weeds. There are some edible weeds out there like purslane um, and oxalis. And so they will snack on those um, to help make the task a little more enjoyable. And sometimes you find that um, weeds are pretty good at masquerading, you know, um, they can hide in your landscape beds, sometimes in pots. And you know, if they don't look too bad, maybe go with it. Um, right in the middle of this picture, there's a little chickweed, common chickweed with a little white flower that's hiding in this pot. Um, and um, so that can be another tactic, you know, if you can't, you know, fight them all the time, maybe um, let them live for a while, go with it, um, but maybe control them before they set seed. That might be uh, a good way to go. Here's another picture where we've got a little tiny little velvet leaf with heart-shaped leaves over there on the right side of the slide, has found its way into this pot, doesn't look too bad. Um, one last one here, I uh, believe. Here is an amaranthus, a type of pigweed that is hiding right there in the middle of the slide. Um, it's found itself in with uh, some annuals here, and honestly, it doesn't look too bad. Um, Doug Larson says that a weed is a plant that has mastered every survival skill except for learning how to grow in rows. And you know what? I managed to find in this picture, um, there are some lamb's quarters plants there at the back of the slide that are indeed growing in a row there. Um, so they've even figured it out here. Um, actually, it's probably um, just a result of their cultivation practices here, I would guess. Okay, so when we're controlling weeds, um, certainly identification, proper identification is really, really important. And um, I used to tell um, folks in my pesticide applicator training clinics that it was, you know, it was the most important thing. You had to identify every weed first. And then I realized, you know what, that is not 
practical. Um, who takes the time to ID everything uh, before they control it? I know I don't. Um, certainly, identification is important. You know, it can help you. If you, you want to know what are the majority of the weed species that you have, you know, what are you up against? Um, certainly, by knowing what weeds you have, you can determine, you know, what is the most appropriate way to control that weed. You know, do you have an annual weed that you can maybe just pull out of the ground by hand, or are you up against something bigger? You know, you have Canada thistle that produces sturdy rhizomes that you can pull it out of the ground, but odds are you're not going to get all of it. Um, by knowing what weed you have, it can help you choose, say you go to use a herbicide, it can help you figure out, you know, what is the best type of herbicide to use, when is the best time to apply it. Um, so identification really, really does help. Also, you know, if you have um, say you have a bunch of seedlings that are in your bed. Um, maybe they, you figure out that they are mulberry seedlings. Um, then you can determine where are they coming from. You know, maybe you've got a mulberry tree on the back of the property. Um, so it can help you stop maybe the source, if you can, <laughs> stop the source of that tree. So identification really, really does help. Um, now, of course, it's best if you can identify your seed your plants when they're seedlings so that you have time to figure out you know how to control them um, certainly they're more susceptible to herbicides when they're seedlings but seedling identification can be really challenging uh, and I've had folks say you know well it's hard to know when they're that little you know did I plant them there um, I don't know what it is um, just a couple of tips with that um, certainly if if you're um, if you see things in a group of three, <laughs> then odds are you've planted it there. Um, if you see um, seedlings in a completely random pattern, um, then it's probably going to be something you didn't plant. Or if you've got that same species growing in every bed on your property, odds are it's not something that you have, prop you have planted. Um, another thing you can do is maybe get out your camera, take some pictures. Um, certainly you can send those pictures to your local extension office and they can assist with identification there. Um, and, you know, and once you find out what you do have, then, you know, label those pictures and then you've got those for future years um, to, uh, to help you remember what they are. I mentioned a while ago, you know, if you have a perennial weed like... Um, um, Canada thistle, um, certainly that is is um, one that you want to be aware of. Um, these are some of the more common perennial weeds that uh, we might have in a landscape. And if you've got those, um, odds are you know it. Um, you know that you are up against something that's a little more challenging to control. But I would encourage you to start early with your controls um, because these can really establish themselves quickly. Um, they can produce, you know, structures like rhizomes in as little as four to six weeks. And so do control them early. Let's talk about control methods. Um, certainly um, cultural control methods um, involve uh, bear, uh, covering bare soil perhaps, to prevent weed seed germination. Um, mechanical practices would include things like um, hand removal or cutting. Then we have chemical controls, and this uses um, herbicides, um, both pre-emergent and post-emergent products there. And just going back to cultural real quick, um, certainly um, it all starts with good horticultural practices. So you want to make sure that you've um, chosen the right type of plant for your growing conditions, for your location. Um, proper bed preparation is important, you know, and, and, and giving those plants what they need to really um, compete well with weeds. So making sure they have adequate water, um, fertilizing them properly and so forth, because you want those plants to be competitive. Uh, just a little gardening rule here. Uh, when weeding, the best way to make sure you are removing a weed and not a viable plant is to pull on it. And if it comes out of the ground easily, it is a valuable plant. Um, and certainly, uh, that is the truth. All right, hand weeding. Um, so um, hand weeding, you know, provides many benefits. Um, 
one thing I really like about hand painting is that it provides instant gratification, you know, instant results. You can change the look of an area in a pretty short amount of time, um, you know, with a little hand weeding. Um, it does provide good exercise. You can burn quite a few calories, um, 105 calories uh, for only a half hour, which isn't too bad. Um, hand weeding can also be used to help delay seed production. So um, if you're out hand weeding and you come across, um, say, a pokeweed that um, has a pretty sturdy taproot on it, they're hard to get out of the ground sometimes. Um, at the very least, you can just take your clippers and clip the top out of it, you know, and that's going to set it back. It will delay seed production on that plant until you can um, get to it with a shovel on another day. Now, there are some, of course, downsides to hand weeding. Um, many of those can be felt um, in your body um, for hours after you are done hand weeding. You might have aches and pains in your hand and in your back. Um, and um, so that can be a challenge. Um, and then, of course, perennials. Um, you know, you can you can hand weed perennials. You can, you know, try to pull that dandelion out of the ground, you know, there in the picture. But you're going to have to get the whole taproot out of the ground, too, or it will come back. And so that's a challenge. Um, and then, of course, hand weeding is very time-consuming um, as well. Now, maybe you hate hand weeding. You know, if you would much rather get on the floor and scrub your floors, then do that instead. You know, maybe you can hire someone to weed your gardens. Um, maybe you hire someone to do it for you, or maybe you hire someone to do it with you. So you've got company. I have worked for both types of people, um, both ways. And uh, either way, you know, it gets the job done. Um, another thing you could do is you could put the kids to work um, if you can get them to do that for you. Um, I'm a farm kid, and uh, so I spent a lot of time when I was younger walking beans, um, walking down the rows and cutting out the weeds with a weed hook or a hoe. And then when I was a little older, Dad built this tractor-mounted sprayer here where we sat on the front, and um, we had um, hand wands, and we sprayed Roundup on the weeds. And you can bet um, he was up, you know, he was driving, so he could... He knew where reverse was. He would hit reverse and point out the weeds that you missed. Um, so uh, certainly hire, hire some helpers. Um, the stinging nettle picture up there um, reminds me of uh, my husband's um, worst uh, nightmare weeding job was when he was a kid. Um, they had a neighbor that paid him a dollar an hour to hand pull stinging nettle. But she never provided any gloves or any tools. And, you know, he was young enough, he didn't know to say anything. But stinging nettle, of course, can hurt. Um, the uh, stiff hairs on the stem contain a small drop of formic acid, which is extremely irritating to the skin. Um, so if you do hire workers, make sure that you um, provide them with all the tools um, that they need to, to protect themselves. Um, and I mentioned, you know, maybe you can get the kids to help weed for you. Um, here's the future of hand weeding at my house. Um, this picture is a couple years old, though. They're a little older, and um, I still don't have it fully figured out how to get them to um, pull all my weeds for me. Maybe one of these days I'll, I'll get it figured out. All right, um, what does hand weeding cost? Well, um, here's uh, just some uh, data that... Um, that actually Dow Agro um, has available. They've got an online calculator now that you can play with. You can go in and, and put in your numbers and and, um, and figure out what it will cost you. But um, years ago, before their little online tool, they had some uh, essentially the same data available. But they had said at the time that the average length of time to um, hand weed a thousand square feet is about an hour. And um, the approximate wage for an employee pulling weeds at our current minimum wage in Illinois is eight and a quarter. And so that is, works out to uh, about $360 an acre. And if control lasts on average about four weeks, um, then it costs about a little over four grand to hand weed one acre 
um, per year. Um, so that's considerable. You know, your, your time is worth something. Um, and it could be that you're paying a worker more than minimum wage. So it could, you know, cost you more than that even. Um, just some uh, tips um, and tools for hand weeding, if you will. Um, to, to help make hand weeding be a little more enjoyable. Um, certainly, good soil moisture makes it easier. It's so much easier to pull those weeds out of the soil when the soil's a little bit wet. Um, so maybe wait till after it's rained or um, get out the garden hose and water those beds a little bit before you pull them. Also, it's helpful too sometimes to let your plants grow, let your weeds, I should say, grow just a little before you pull them. Um, not too much though, uh, but I know I, I worked for a woman one time and she wanted us to pull, boy, those weeds as soon as they emerged from the ground. And it was really taxing on your brain. <laughs> it was hard on your hands. And we finally talked her into, you know, give it a few more days, let them get a little more height. They'll be easier to handle. Um, you want to get some good gloves. Um, the ones in the picture there are my absolute favorite, um, and I believe there's some knockoff brands now. But essentially, they've got the nitrile grip on your fingers, and then they've got a fabric there on the back so your hands don't get so hot. Um, but that nitrile grip is really, um, really nice for, um, for having a good grip on the weeds, for pulling those out easily. Um, Knee pads can be really helpful, or um, maybe it's just sitting on a bucket that's flipped upside down. Um, certainly can help you get down to those areas. Some more tools here. Um, dandelion forks are available, and they've got them in varying lengths. Um, you know, it's a matter of personal preference. I've got a shorter one, and that's what I like. But if I had to do a large area, I think I would rather have a longer handle on it. So it's up to you. Um, a dethatching rake uh, is listed here. I had a gardener tell me one time that um, that's what she uses on her Creeping Charlie, um, and she called it an expensive treat, um, but um, something that she kind of enjoyed, um, ripping the Creeping Charlie out of her grass there. Also, it's helpful if you keep um, your tools handy and visible. Um, so, you know, some people will use a belt that they've got all their tools on. Um, I just prefer a bucket. I keep everything in a bucket and it's easy to carry around. Um, some will paint their um, tools maybe a, like a fluorescent color, a bright color, so they're easy to see, so they don't lose them out in the garden. Um, others will hang them on uh, maybe a garden shed, like on the outside of the building, so that they are easy to grab, you know, once they spot a weed that needs to be taken care of right away. So the trick is just to, you know, find out what works for you. Um, of course, when you are hand weeding, you want to collect and dispose of your weeds properly. And um, so um, I really like um, to use the tip bags like you see in the bottom right hand corner that they're, they're flexible, you know, they store easily in your garage, they're lightweight, um, but you could just use a bucket. Um, I've seen gardeners who will just um, collect the weeds and make piles along the pathway for their husband to come along later and pick up. So, hey, whatever works in your house, whatever system you can um, work out um, is great. Um, but certainly you want to, um, um, dispose of your weeds, put them in, um, you know, I, I would recommend that you don't put them into your compost pile, you know, unless you are going to heat your compost to, I think it's at least 180 degrees Fahrenheit, it will not kill weed seeds. And um, so um, you'll want to collect those, dispose of them either in, um, you know, if they have landscape, um, or, garden waste pickup days or whatever, or maybe you can burn them wherever you are. Um, but uh, here's just a little example of what happens when you toss your um, seeds in with your compost, um, the, um, and then you take that compost and fill in some spots in your yard. You can end up with um, uh, lamb's ear 
which is what happened here um, because uh, lambs are in with your turf because the seeds aren't killed um, and you know sometimes on your weeds maybe there's a flower there but you, you pull the plant and it's in flower and those plants will still have time before they dry up and die to go ahead and produce seed um, that can be viable so um, um, I'd recommend that you, you don't compost your weed seeds. Um, here's just another common example. Pumpkins and gourds have been known to spread this way too and sometimes take over your compost bin. Um, mowing and trimming. Um, mowing and trimming, uh, certainly commonly used, um, can be used to prevent the development and spread of seed. Um, certainly um, ditch banks in the country are often mowed um, for these reasons to help keep the weed seeds out of the crops, um, neighboring areas. Um, mowing can be used if it's properly timed um, to uh, uh, prevent uh, maybe the spread of dandelion seeds in a lawn. Um, mowing can also be used to keep the growth in check, uh, maybe using it repeatedly, maybe to deplete um, a weed's food reserves. Um, mowing also, um, you want to mow as high as the use and appearance will allow um, in your lawns, um, certainly to help shade out weeds. Um, buckhorn plantain, I have seen firsthand, um, mowing a little higher really does reduce that population of that weed. Uh, it helps to shade out that plant. Um, you'll find a lot of times with mowing and trimming that perennial grasses will not be controlled this way. Um, something like quackgrass um, has the ability to survive mowing and trimming, you know, just like the turf grass does in your lawn, your perennial turf grasses. Also, a lot of times if we use a lot of mowing and trimming, we may see a shift in species, um, maybe to something uh, low growing like say white clover that can tolerate a lot of mowing. Tillage. A couple of notes on tillage. Um, tillage can be used for uprooting and chopping uh, up weeds. If you have uh, existing weeds, um, maybe you could use a mantis tiller. I had a gardener tell me that um, she loves, loves, loves her mantis tiller, and she uses it in the spring um, to, as she calls, tickle the soil. Um, she goes down around two inches in the soil around some of her farther space perennials. If she has a lot of um, uh, weedy areas around them, and um, she says it's very relaxing. Um, I would recommend, though, that you keep your tillage on the shallow side for a couple of reasons. One is um, you want to avoid damage to roots of your um, ornamental species. So certainly you want to stay back um, from, uh, you know, enough distance from your ornamentals to avoid injury. But also deep tillage tends to bring up uh, weed seeds that are buried in the soil that could be viable. Um, once they get up high enough and get sunlight. So um, keep your tillage on the shallow side if at all possible. Tillage certainly encourages weeds. A lot of times if you stir up the soil, you bring those seeds up and you can have weeds. Um, another tip, of course, is to keep your hose, uh, your tillage equipment sharp. Um, Christmas is coming. Maybe... Um, Ask your friends, family members, they're looking for gift ideas for you. Maybe they can um, get your uh, tools sharpened for you, your clippers, your pruners, your hose. Um, sharp equipment certainly does um, make the job easier for you. So I mentioned that um, tillage encourages weeds <laughs> sometimes. So, you know, should you till, should you not? Uh, a lot of times it really depends on the situation. You know, if you have a vegetable garden that has bare soil, um, you know, then then maybe if you used a hoe, like um, the uh, two-way hoe that's in the picture here, um, that can eliminate weeds pretty quickly and, um, and uh, would be a good way to go. Um, other times where maybe you would not want to tell, if you have common purslane, so the plant that's pictured there in the slide. Um, common purslane can spread with tilling. Um, and I'll show you a picture in just a minute of that. Um, you want to cover, oh, if you have, um, say you have an area that has some small seedlings and you're going to put mulch on top of it anyway. Um, 
You really don't need to till the area first. The mulch will smother out those weeds. So you could save time there by not tilling. Um, here's just an example of common purslane and what it does um, after you take a tiller to it. Um, you can see the only plant that survived the tiller here is common purslane. Um, it's kind of like a jade plant. It's very succulent and you break those parts up and, and there's a lot of water there in those plants and so they're able to reroot and establish themselves again. Now, if you have, um, say, a few random weeds, um, maybe it's best to, um, you know, rather than break out the hoe and till up the whole area, just hand pull those few weeds. Again, you know, if you, less disturbance to the soil is probably best in the long run because you are less likely to bring up viable seeds up to the soil surface. Um, on the flip side, you know, if you've got a blanket of weeds out there, um, you could take forever hand weeding all of those. Um, maybe it's best to break out the hoe or the tiller and just go ahead and till that site. So Barbara Pleasant says, where humans cultivate, garden weeds grow. Um, but I say, don't disturb the soil if you don't need to. Um, certainly, you want to avoid creating any work for you, um, you know, either in the future or in your current situation. Um, and weeds really, really do um, like bare areas. Um, you know, if you go out and you take a tiller to your garden, um, how long does that soil stay bare? Not for very long, right? And weeds will find their ways back to um, that site. And here's just a picture of essentially they, you know, they the vinca was there in the bed, um, and then there was a tree kind of right there in the middle. Well, they cut the tree down, they took it out, and of course tilled up the soil a lot when they, you know, got those tree roots out of there. And soon after, all that little green weed that you see there in the left um, bottom corner there, the left that half of the slide, is um, essentially a type of speedwell that came in and, and took over. Um, Mother Nature really does not like bare soil. She thinks the earth should be green, and she does a good job of keeping it that way. All right, so speaking of keeping the earth green, um, another way to uh, maybe prevent weeds in your landscape is simply just to plant tightly. Um, and this is just one solution. You know, you look at a landscape like this and there's very little room for weeds to survive in a landscape this tightly packed. Another thing you could do maybe is just um, go big. Um, maybe use big Tall plants like tropicals, uh, they provide nice impact, of course, but they also provide shade for weeds. Um, so um, banana, elephant ears, tropical hibiscus um, can all give you that same effect. Ground covers. Ground covers do an excellent job of um, covering up bare soil and keeping weed seeds in the dark, so they prevent weeds. And the trick, of course, is to choose a, a ground cover that's well suited for your site and something that will fill in relatively quick, quickly. Um, now some of these um, may be kind of slow to get going in the spring. Um, I know the plumbago in the bottom right hand corner there is a little slow to get going and so you might have some weeds that um, are able to come up before your ground cover gets well established. Uh, and there are lots and lots of ground covers to choose from. Uh, beware, some of them can be a little bit on the invasive side. Uh, Bishop's Weed is um, there in the top, um, top left picture. And then there it is again in the top right. And you can see on that one that it has spread over um, across the bricks off into the turf area. Um, on the bottom left is a juga. It can be invasive as well at times. Um, and don't dismiss violets. Um, violets make an excellent ground cover for um, wooded areas. Um, and I, you know, I was always taught that, oh, violets are weeds. They're weeds, they're weeds. Um, but um, I've changed my thinking on violets over the years, and they really do make an excellent uh, ground cover in certain situations. Um, ground covers for vegetable gardens. Uh, of course, you know, there are 
several different types of materials that work quite well. Um, straw is commonly used in a vegetable garden. Leaves, um, even black plastic works um, pretty nicely if you have uh, maybe peppers uh, or tomatoes in those areas. Um, mulch in an ornamental bed. Um, I, uh, boy, I think nothing beats the look of a newly mulched bed. You've got that nice, even colored backdrop uh, for green plants. And um, of course, we have many types to choose from. Um, certainly, the organic or carbon-based types are going to be um, really best for plants. Um, so we have, you know, chipped um, types or the shredded there in the top pictures there. Um, even pine needles uh, can work well for mulch and keeping weed pressure down. Uh, I had a gardener tell me that they use turned over sod in their garden and works pretty well. Uh, of course, there are other types available. Um, the cocoa hulls um, can be nice. They could smell nice too. Uh, if you have uh, dogs, you want to be cautious with those as, as that can be poisonous for dogs. Um, recycled rubber um, can be long lasting in a landscape bed as well. And of course, there's pros and cons um, to all of these types of mulches. There's no one perfect system. Uh, if you come up with one, let me know. I'd love to know about it. Um, with mulch, typically if you apply two to four inches um, thick of mulch, it does a really nice job of keeping weed pressure down. Now with the carbon um, or the organic uh, types, of course, those are going to break down over time. So you will need to replenish those, you know, maybe even a couple times a year, um, certainly annually. And sometimes they can blow in the wind, they break down. Um, the finer texture you have, of course, is, is going to break down more quickly. Um, try, if you can, to use a weed-free mulch. Use uh, materials that are free of weed seeds. Um, we all know that weeds are, are perfectly capable of hitchhiking from time to time. Um, and there are actually herbicide-treated mulches that are available in the market. I know um, Preen makes one called Preen Mulch Plus. Um, that uh, claims to control weeds for about six months. Uh, but, um, you know, those have a herbicide in them. So you want to read and follow all label directions very carefully there. Um, so mulch works really well to prevent seed germination that's under the mulch. Uh, unfortunately, it will not prevent seed germination if the seeds land on top. So, for example, the picture there on the right um, are little maple seedlings um, from the whirligigs or the helicopters or the Samaras, I think they're technically called. Um, those will land on top and they can germinate and uh, mulch will not stop that. Mulch unfortunately also will not stop the spread of or the growth of rhizomes uh, or plants that come up from root stalks um, or stolen. So the dandelion here, um, you'd have to pile on your mulch really thick to stop that dandelion from coming up through. Um, and, um, of course, um, you are probably all familiar with the right way to mulch, and um, you've probably all seen the volcano mulch that uh, ends up out there, um, which is unfortunate. Uh, I know sometimes landscapers get in a hurry when they uh, make these piles around the trees, but, of course, um, we want to give the uh, main trunk of that tree lots of breathing room to prevent um, disease and insect problems. So keep the mulch away from the base of that plant um, certainly would help. Now, what not to do with mulch? Um, you know, it's best, of course, if you can plant your plants and then come back and then put in the mulch. Um, some prefer, and you know, and, and sometimes it just works out that way, um, that you but maybe have your mulch down first and then you plant your plants into it. But when you do that, um, don't dig up your soil and dump it right on top of your mulch because certainly there are weed seeds in that soil um, which you have now just brought up to sunlight and you can have some weed problems, of course. Um, so maybe dump it in a bucket or on a tarp or a piece of plastic and that will help you in the long run. Um, one gardener reported that mulch can be entertaining. Um, this was her son's bicycle ramp that he built um, on her mulch pile. Um, you know, you could even put down as an added barrier, you could put down um, several layers of newspaper. 
and then put the mulch on top of it. And that will help um, really block the sunlight uh, from getting to the weed seeds. Now the, the newspaper will degrade over time. And you can see in this, this picture, this bed was about two months old. Um, and it's already starting to break up a little bit there. Um, but it works pretty well. And um, if you have a local newspaper, um, check with them because sometimes they have um, extra rolls of paper that they're done with that um, you can get for a low, low price. Landscape fabric um, can be used as an added barrier um, around beds or maybe along pathways. This method can work really well. Um, the landscape fabric, of course, um, you would want one that blocks the sunlight um, to the seeds that also allows for um, water and air uh, to move down through it. Um, and of course, landscape fabric will not last forever. Um, over time, you will have um, rhizomes will um, root down into them or push up through them, or you'll have weed seeds land on top of them. Um, so they don't last forever. Although there are some on the market now that can last a long time. There are some um, that have a 20 or a 30 year warranty on them. Um, and the Daylun products, um, they offer an extensive line of uh, these landscape fabrics to choose from. Um, you would, of course, want to put down um, wood chips maybe on top of your uh, landscape fabric to make it look nicer, um, but also to uh, help it last a little longer. Um, so again, it won't last forever. Um, over time, you know, if your chips break down or they blow away, sometimes you'll see the little corner of your landscape fabric um, flapping in the breeze there. Um, so, you know, they're not, they're not perfect. Um, for every situation, but they can be helpful for, for pathways and, and certain situations. Another option for you, perhaps, is um, a rubber tree ring. And um, these pictures are not the most beautiful, I realize, um, but I've been told that rubber tree rings are not the most beautiful. Maybe uh, they're better suited for the backyard landscape. Um, but they do really nicely around newly planted trees. You know, if you're concerned about lawnmower damage and, you know, mowing and trimming up close to that tree, um, the rubber tree rings make maintenance a lot easier for those sites. Um, I have found that um, they will not keep weeds down forever. Um, sometimes quack grass is pretty good at pushing its way up through that little spot of sunlight in that ring. Um, so that's what's going on in the bottom right corner there. But if you pick them up and give them a turn, give them half a turn, a couple times a year, it takes care of that problem. Maybe just an option for you. All right, and then of course we have herbicides. And um, with herbicides, um, these of course are um, chemicals that are used to affect some normal growth process that goes on in the plant, and they're specific to plants. So uh, for example, we have some herbicides that are photosynthesis inhibitors. So they block photosynthesis that goes on in that plant. Um, now herbicides um, can provide very quick results. So some are very fast acting, um, some with little time investment on your part. And uh, you know, if you have a lot of hand weeding to do, you may find that it's more efficient to use a herbicide. Um, some herbicides offer residual control, which means that they will um, continue to um, prevent weeds for uh, maybe a few months. Um, some of them um, do not offer any residual control. You're only going to control the weeds that you see that day, that you spray that day. Some are selective. They control some types of weeds, not others. Others are non-selective. They will control all types of plants um, or certainly ding them up badly. Um, and just like with hand weeding, um, repeat applications would be needed for a herbicide. It's not a, a one and done type of situation. Um, and certainly uh, many times these are site dependent, so they won't work on all plants in or on all weeds in all plants either. So you need to um, you know think about where you're going to apply it and keep that in mind when you are buying one. And of course with herbicides you want to carefully 
read, follow, and make sure you understand all label directions. Make sure that your crop or area that you want to apply to is indeed listed there on the label. Um, you know, for example, I've, I've heard of cases where um, someone got a, um, a pesticide to, that their neighbor gave them that they use on field corn, and now they plan to use it on their sweet corn in their garden. Um, it's, it's dangerous to, to do so. Um, it's certainly illegal to do so. You, you need to make sure that your sweet corn would be listed on that label. Um, so that you know that it's it's okay to apply it there. Um, check the label um, for any harvest intervals where essentially they're telling you to wait so many days before you would uh, be able to harvest um, in those uh, treated areas. Um, keep in mind too that that um, um, you want to carefully obey all of the um, rate. Uh, the, the limits there on the label for how much you use. Um, sometimes folks will say, well, if a little's good, more's better. Um, that does not apply to the use of pesticides. And um, certainly um, it can uh, create a dangerous situation and, and it's illegal to do so. Uh, and sometimes, too, you don't get as good a weed control. You know, the manufacturers have carefully studied those rates and figured out what is the best rate to work. Um, sometimes if you go ahead and apply more, um, it, it doesn't work as well. It maybe burns the tissue before it actually gets into the plant and moves within the plant. Um, and then the last note here, of course, is um, if you need help in understanding the label, uh, you, of course, uh, would want to uh, contact the manufacturer. I think that's best because the manufacturer has written that label and they know what they're talking about um, on, on that label. Hopefully they do. All right, so we have pre-emergent herbicides, the preventers. They um, are ones that would um, prevent weed seed germination. And so here are just a few examples. Um, and with the preventer herbicides, of course, where you apply them is important. Um, you would want these to end up down where most of your weed seeds are. So usually in the top couple inches of the soil. So sometimes they need to be tilled into the soil. Sometimes you can rely on rainfall to move them down into the soil. And uh, of course, we would need good soil moisture for these to be taken up by a weed seed that's germinating. So for them to be most effective, we want a little bit of rain. Um, these form a barrier in the soil, so once you've applied your product, you don't want to go back into that area and dig up that area because then you are messing up your barrier that you just created. And the residual length does vary on these products, um, so check those labels. Um, also keep in mind, too, that um, the weather conditions can affect residual. If we have a warm, wet year, the products will break down faster in the soil. So if we get a lot of rain, it's really warm, sometimes you know you, your weed control will not last as long as that label said it was going to, and you may have weeds um, come through sooner. Uh, be sure to read the labels carefully. Um, there might be some precautions on there. Um, it, it might say things like, um, do not apply to wet foliage of your ornamental plants where it can cause injury. Um, Sometimes uh, bulbs, there might be warnings on there and making applications around species of bulbs um, that injury can result. And then also a lot of times the preventer herbicides tend to work better on small seeded weeds. So for example, they work better on um, like lamb's quarters or pigweed species and maybe not work as well on like giant ragweed or burr that have really large weed seeds. Just a comment uh, here from a fellow gardener. Even with the springtime application of preen, the weeds come back by August. And um, certainly, you know, you're going to need a couple of applications of these for season-long control. But honestly, I don't think August is too bad. That's, that's pretty good. Um, we have um, post-emergent herbicides as well, and these are just a few of them. We actually have more than what's listed here, um, but these will kill or suppress the growth of any existing weeds. And um, so um, they, uh, 
can unfortunately cause damage to nearby plants that might be sensitive. So if, when you're spraying these, you really want to pay attention to what direction the wind is out of, uh, what your wind speeds are. Typically, we would want wind speeds to be between 3 and 10 miles per hour. Um, we would want the wind to be a blowing away from sensitive plants. Um, if you get a little bit of spray on a desirable plant, um, you could maybe rip off the leaves um, before that herbicide has a chance to work on that plant. Maybe you could take um, a watering can and wash off that herbicide, might be an option. Or before you spray, you could cover up sensitive plants maybe with um, plastic or buckets to help protect them. But some of these um, post-emergent products can be very fast acting. Um, sometimes there's combination products available that um, one herbicide is spiked into the mix, make things show symptoms faster. Um, and um, if you have perennial weeds, a post-emergent herbicide uh, a lot of times is your most effective way of dealing with that weed. Just a couple of tips on applying these post-emergent herbicides. Of course, you would want to pay attention to the weather. Um, I know sometimes the rain or the uh, weathermen don't even know when it's going to rain, but um, go to them first, though, and, and see when they're thinking it, it's going to rain. Plan your applications accordingly. Um, check the label to see how soon it's rained fast. Or look on this one, it says rainproof in one hour. So that's, that's pretty short. That's pretty good. Um, Typically, when we make applications to, say, our lawns, um, we would want to avoid mowing or cultivation for a few days before and after those applications. And that's so that we are protecting the weeds so we have a good leaf surface area there um, for the herbicide to get onto that weed and then also to to work, you know, to move within that plant. We wouldn't want to spray the plant and then come right back in there and chop the leaves right back off. Um, so we need to allow these products time to work. And of course, we'll get our best control when our weeds are actively growing. Um, so they're not suffering from any sort of drought stress or anything. When should weeds be controlled? Um, they're all best controlled as seedlings. And um, certainly when they're seedlings, they are more susceptible to herbicides. Also, they're easier to physically handle. And I would guess that most of you, if I asked you, which bull thistle would you rather control in this picture, or in these pictures, um, I think most of you are going to say you want the seedling. Um, the adult might make you bleed. Um, just real quick, in the interest of time, we're going to go through these rather quickly. Um, if you have annual weeds, um, now this is, um, you know, we're looking at when would be the best time to make our herbicide applications with the post-emergent herbicide. And certainly with annuals, the earlier you can get to them, the better. Um, catch them before they flower and produce seeds. Biennial weeds, when they're seedlings, that's the best time. If you miss that seedling stage, then the rosette stage between the first and second years is also a good time. And then for perennial weeds, um, again, seedling stage is the best time. Um, but if you miss that seedling stage, um, anywhere from the bud to bloom stage is a decent time. Uh, maybe um, some uh, fall regrowth there is, is, is a good time as well. Or in the fall, you know, when those plants are starting to um, prepare for the winter, they're moving uh, things down into the roots and they'll help carry your herbicide down with it. All right, so just some, some quick tips on what to wear when you're using herbicides. Uh, maybe you've bought herbicides in the past, but you haven't used them because when it comes right down to it, you're um, uh, maybe concerned about their use or, or covering up your body. Um, and these are just my personal tips because um, I think if you're prepared, um, you're, um, you know, and the process is simple, you're more likely to use them. Um, so get yourself some disposable chemical resistant gloves. Um, the nitrile ones work really well for light use pesticides. Um, wear old clothes when you're out there spraying so that if you have a spill um, on your clothes, um, you can throw away those clothes and not be upset about losing your favorite gardening dress. Um, disposable chemical resistant coveralls are also available and they really don't cost that much. 
Um, so it, you know, it's nice to have those on hand, and then you don't have to worry about getting pesticides on your clothes. Some tips on sprayers. Uh, it's best to look for one with an adjustable nozzle, um, and you know, one that has a flat fan nozzle um, is going to provide the best coverage for weeds. Um, certainly the, the ones that go from holocone to straight stream uh, might be better for fungicides or insecticides. And, and, you know, and find a sprayer that, that's a good size for you that's comfortable. You know, yes, there are bigger ones that are available, but if it's going to cause a lot of strain on your body, you won't use it. <clears throat> Excuse me. So find one that you're comfortable with. It's also a good idea, too, um, if you can, maybe have multiple sprayers and, and dedicate them to the cause. So maybe have one that is just used for Roundup or one that's just used for like 2,4-D for on your lawn. And then you don't have to worry about getting them so clean, you know. Um, you can just mark them up with a marker. That's only what goes in it. Um, and it makes the cleanup so much easier. Um, also, keep an extra set of measuring cups, you know, there in the garage. Mark them up with a Sharpie so you know that they are only for measuring pesticides. Um, keep a little bottle of dish soap handy, you know, for cleanup you know, yeah. there in your garage. Some differences in formulations. Um, certainly, uh, when you buy a, um, pesticides, you'll find that there are a lot on the shelves. There's a lot to take in, and, and uh, trying to figure out what's best can be a challenge. Um, there are, for the most part, there are liquid formulations available and dry formulations. Um, what to use um, is preference, or, or it could be that there's only one formulation available for what you need. Um, there are also some gel formulations, foam um, formulations available as well. Concentrates versus ready to use. Um, that is personal preference. Kind of depends on what you're trying to kill as well. Um, I keep both on hand. You know, if, if I've got one little spot of quack grass that I don't want to mix up a sprayer for, it's nice to have that little bottle, that little spray bottle ready to use available. But if I've got a large area to spray, I could blow through my whole little squirt bottle <laughs> ready to use in no time flat. So then it makes sense to have the concentrate um, for those bigger areas. There is some uh, confusion that results um, from brand names. Um, just an example here, Preen is a pretty popular um, brand of uh, preventer herbicides. Um, but keep in mind that all Preens are not equal. Um, so here's an example of three different preens that are entirely different products and may be used in different areas for different things. Um, just a picture here of what you might see when you are looking at the shelves. Um, and Roundup is another one that we see this brand name confusion with. Um, you know, it used to be that Roundup was just Roundup, but that's not the case anymore. Here's five different formulations of Roundup that they're all slightly different animals. You know, some have, uh, will provide extended control, others won't. Um, then in addition to just the Roundups, there are generics available as well too. So different formulation, or um, different manufacturers that are uh, selling that product as well. And a lot of times the um, generic formulations work just as well. So you can maybe save some money um, there. Just a quick note on home remedies. Um, home remedies are typically not something we recommend. Um, I know that um, there are a lot of magical, wonderful recipes that abound on um, Pinterest and on Facebook and social media, and um, uh, various you know combinations of uh, salt and vinegar and and um, so forth, um, borax perhaps. Um, we find we find that uh, a lot of these, um, you know, they haven't been studied, they haven't been replicated. Uh, a lot of times, it's hard to get that right rate, and the rate may vary depending on what you're trying to kill. Um, sometimes, if you get the rate too high, um, you end up with one heck of a mess. Um, borax is is one that if the rate's too high, you can ruin your soil where nothing grows there. Um, and so um, we have a lot of issues 
um, with home remedies. Um, certainly, we uh, just stick to um, recommending the um, EPA registered herbicides that have been um, tested, and they have label guidance for safety there for you. Um, you know, sometimes it helps to take a different look at weeds and um, maybe you can make them work for you. If you can't beat them, join them. Um, and here were just a couple of pictures that um, are sites that I ran across that I thought, hey, the weeds don't look too bad here. Here's henbit um, as a little purple ground cover in the spring. And then um, yellow nut sedge um, in the picture in the bottom there it looks kind of pretty uh, with those plants. Also, another way to look at it is, um, you know, maybe you can find the positive attributes to, um, to weeds. Uh, maybe some of these, you know, are edible. And there are several um, edible guides available, books about eating weeds and foraging. Um, some of them are um, fairly entertaining to read. The, the Yule Gibbons books, uh, I've read some of those. Those are entertaining. Um, so if you can't beat them, eat them. Um, just a couple other comments on weed control. I found that uh, some are very passionate about their weed control. Um, this gardener says, I love, love, love Roundup with a surfactant, especially on thistles and other hard to remove weeds. I've been known to sacrifice a good plant in a mad desire to get rid of a weed patch. Now that is dedication to weed control. Um, for some, you know, it just depends on the day. This one says, I hate using the chemicals though. So I vacillate between who cares about the weeds and wanting to annihilate them. What a difference. Um, and um, a while back, I decided to just take a quick Facebook poll and see what others uh, have found, what works in their garden for weed control. Uh, one said, newspaper topped with mulch. Another said, Roundup, goats, Little boys on four-wheelers. So some unconventional methods here. Uh, another says, in a pinch, Clorox cleanup will kill poison ivy. And I know that's those home remedies, again, are out there. And I know people will do things in a pinch. I myself have been known to kill spiders with a can of hairspray. Uh, what doesn't work? This person said, trying to shoot the stems out from underneath with a rifle from 50 yards does not work. Um, so they found some creative ways. And one last person said, a neighborhood weed pulling party, a heavy brick. But really, why do you need to kill weeds? They are green, they're in my yard, and that's all I have. And I would say that's a pretty good attitude. You know, as long as it's green, go with it. Um, so that is all I have for today. Um, here is my contact information. Um, if you think of any questions or you have any comments or whatever, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, it's probably the best way to catch me, and I'd be more than happy to, um, to assist with that. Um, just a quick reminder as well. Um, there are past recordings of the Four Seasons Gardening series that are available on YouTube. Um, so I bet you if you went to um, YouTube and just searched for Four Seasons Gardening, you could find it easier than you can remember that link there. Um, but uh, check those out. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you for your attention today. Jerseyville has a question. Hi, Jerseyville. Yeah. Jerseyville, are you there? Oh, goodness. Okay. 
Um, let's see. Someone has a question about term termites in the wood mulch, and I can't really address that, but Phil Nixon would be a better one to address that. I would say um, um, if you were concerned about that, you'd probably want to keep your mulch away from the foundation of your buildings by a few inches, but I am not the right one to speak about termites. Um, Phil would be better with that. Um, oh, there's a lot of questions here. Let's see. I'll do my best to try to keep track of these. Let's see. Um, what is your best advice for smothering weed seedlings? How thick and what to use? Um, you could use plastic tarps. You could use... Um, Someone um, recently was asking about, um, uh, they had like highway signs, metal highway signs. That would work too, um, you know, just to kill off the growth. Um, uh, if you were using newspaper, I've heard before that, um, you know, several um, uh, sheets of newspaper, uh, someone said the thickness of the New York Times. Um, I don't take that paper, but I'm thinking it's pretty thick. Um, you might be able to get by with less than that. Um, let's see, how thick, what to use. Ratios are how do you figure out how they work? Oh, that goes with your previous one. Sometimes generic herbicides work just as well. Do you compare ratios or how do you figure how they work? Um, yeah, certainly looking at the percentage on the label of the active ingredient. Um, that is a good way um, at the end of the day, though, it's tricky because sometimes the rates are different, and um, so it's not an apples to apples kind of thing. Um, so it, it can be challenging to do. Yes. Um, let's back up here. There was one on uh, do you recommend removing poison ivy in the fall? Is there a benefit to removing it then as opposed to the spring with um, Tordon? Um, with Tordon, I think you mean Tordon. Um, Fall is an excellent time for poison ivy. Um, take a flag and, you know, unless you, you you know where the plant is and you're going to know where it is, um, take a flag and mark it somehow, though, um, so you can come back to it for later and see if you killed it or not. Um, but fall is an excellent time, um, certainly for perennials. Um, it helps aid in your control. Um, and you may have to hit it again in the spring. You know, um, but Tordon um, typically, or, or Garlon, uh, would be a good choice um, for uh, poison ivy. Or um, a lot of times, uh, some of the herbicides will say uh, brush killer or poison ivy killer right on it. Um, and it will have, uh, say, triclopyr right in the mix. Here's kind of a outline of exactly how to do it. Let's see. I'm looking to see if I have any questions I didn't answer. I think I got them all. Do you want to ask questions? Yeah, Mariah, yes, I do. Okay, go ahead. You, you spell oh, it right. Okay. Um, I oh. have a big garden that between uh, my father's death and the rain and uh, celebration of life, right now <laughs> it's got a lot of purslane and uh, tall grasses with lots of seeds. Okay. So I always like to put in a green cover crop. Don't see how I can do that. We have a tiller. That's just going to make it worse. Yeah. I don't know what to do, really. And I try not to. I don't like using uh, herbicides. herbicides. I don't like using chemicals. Okay. But if I have to this time, I will, especially in my vegetable garden. Sure. And it's real big. I mean, we had it all cleaned out at one point, and then things just went. So I don't know. Uh, should I put plastic over it? Should I? Should I go ahead? Should I burn it? Should I? Let me think here. a spot that could be. I I would now. Is this? Do you have like perennials in there too, or um, is it just no. an area of weeds? It, it's just, uh, right now we do have, it's a vegetable garden. Vegetable garden, okay. And that's really why I don't want like, to use herbicides. Yeah. And, um, also because, um, and we have some Brussels sprouts right now that are still coming on, and uh, there are some tomatoes that are still hanging in there, but mm -hmm. three-fourths of it is tall weeds. Can you mow it? 
I yep. mean, like mow around the Brussels sprouts, maybe. Weeds. Oh, I'm sorry. What was that? I said if we mow it, we could mow it. Mm -hmm. We have mower, but will that spread the wheat, uh, seeds? No, it could. Yeah, I mean, if it's, I, it, you know, it kind of depends. You know, if you, I'm thinking if you have an, a, a size garden where you could manage it, you could go in and, and hand pull some or clip off the seeds and bag the seeds. We have done you know, that have, like, a lot of fox right now being like treated for a chiropractor and my husband has that knee. <laughs> We're in a bad uh, way here. Can you um I maybe mean, hire some kids to come in and help, like the or like the local four H group to come help or um yeah. or some high school kids to assist with it? Because I know what you mean. Like if you if you've got like, say you had a bunch of foxtails, the one that comes to mind, because I've got an area at home like that. These are a thinner, thinner grass. I mean, uh, with a, not, not the bushy tail, it's the... Okay. I mean, you... I know, you're in kind of a catch-22, because if you... I, I, I would say, you know, I mean, if you wanted to put a plastic over it, you know, or some kind of tarp or cover, it, that would be a good way to go. Yeah. But then you've still got those seeds there already. You know, unless there's a way to hand pull, remove those seeds, they're going to be there. And if you take a mower to it, you know, they're going to be there still. You're going to spread them into surrounding areas. Um, or you chalk it as a loss for this year. Yeah, you added some seed to the mix. Oh, well. And next year you you start new with, um, you know, with some newspaper down and some straw and, and go from there. But um, put that stuff down now. Um, I have a piece of plastic that's from um, a cover of a, what do you call those things? The greenhouse. The, a greenhouse. So I have a huge yeah. plastic cover. It's white, though, not black. Yeah. And, I mean, if I put that down, and would it, that help keep it, like, kill it out over the winter? I would think so. I mean, because you've still, you've still got quite a bit of growing season left. Um, you know, it's hard to know without seeing the site, you uh, know. Well, maybe I'll e'll email you later on with okay. the, um, the mess, a yeah. picture of the mess. Yeah, if you do, she may be able to help. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Sorry, I, I don't know if I'm helping you much, but, um, yeah, no, I, I know what you mean. I've got a, I've got a patch that's, um, got some wildflowers that the foxtail have invaded this year and. And um, so I, I know I, it's hard to, you hate that you've introduced seed into that site, but there's just so many, you can't deal with it all physically, and, and what do you do? So it keeps it interesting. Well, these foxtails are pretty. <laughs> they are kind of pretty. <laughs> you do that. Okay. Oh, my goodness. There are a lot of questions on email. <laughs> Or on the, not email, but the instant message. Okay, let me go back and see what I need to catch up on here. Um, I did that one. Ratios, ratios. What do you recommend right against the garden plants? Um, and I don't know what you mean by that. Um, if I, mulch. I mean, honestly, um, mulch will do well. If you, you know, keep it a couple inches away from the main stem of the plant, you should be fine. Um, can you roll Roundup on a leaf of quackgrass and kill the rhizome? Can you roll it on a leaf? Um, should you use Roundup in a veggie garden? Okay, a couple of things come to mind there. And I think you mean with roll it, I think, think, think. Maybe you mean like to paint it on or to brush it on with like a sponge. Um, and yes, you could do that. Um, with quackgrass, we have very limited controls for quackgrass. And so typically um, we're looking at non-selective control. So, so Roundup, glyphosate. Um, fall would be a good time um, to, to do that, just to kind of paint it on those leaves. Um, there was also a question about should you use Roundup in a veggie garden? Certain formulations of Roundup can be used in a veggie garden. There are some that have, um, like, 
it's like a mazapic, a mazapir. They've got a, uh, an ingredient added to it for an extended control. Those should not be used in a vegetable garden. And the um, labels, read those carefully. They will tell you um, if you can use it around a vegetable garden or not. I'm looking for a good book on identifying grassy weeds. Do you have any recommendations? Um, I do. Let me grab it real quick. Um, okay, I actually have, um, there's two weed books. One, I, I'm mad, I forgot to mention today. Um, one, both of these you can get um, through your local extension office. Uh, but there's one called um, Identifying Weeds in Midwestern Turf and Landscapes, and um, it's a little pocket-sized guide. It's got several grasses in it that uh, Tom Voigt and I worked on a couple years ago, Identifying Weeds in Midwestern Turf and Landscapes. And then the other one, um, specific to grasses, is one that Tom Voigt produced um, with Diane Peterson, and this one is called Identifying Turf and Weedy Grasses of the Northern United States. Identifying Turf and Weedy Grasses of the Northern United States. And um, and like I said, those are both available um, through your local extension office. They can get those for you. Um, does using Tordon sterilize the soil? Um, Tordon um, should break down over time. Uh, I can't tell you off the top of my head how long it lasts in the soil. Um, but it, I want to say it could be several months. Um, in theory, and if it's applied at the right rate and everything, it should last for a while in the soil and then break down, and then normal plant growth should resume in that site. Um, you know, unless it's been used improperly, too high of a rate, um, then you have some issues where things sometimes last longer. Um, do you recommend mulch right up against your garden vegetable stems? I wouldn't, um, although I think I've probably been guilty of doing that and things have been fine. Although garden vegetables, I guess I don't use um, like a wood mulch in my garden. Um, straw, yes, and um, we tend to keep straw uh, away from the stems a little ways, um, certainly just to, even just to give them sunlight. Uh, if you apply a herbicide post-emergent on a weed with seeds, are the seeds still viable once the plant dies? Let me read that again. If you apply herbicide post-emergent on a weed with seeds, are the seeds still viable once the plant dies? Um, yeah, they could be. If they have had time to develop properly, um, then yes, they would still be <laughs> viable. Um, sometimes, like even if you just hand pull, um, a, pl uh, a plant that has seeds that are, are developing, um, it'll still have time to go ahead and develop. Um, now, it could be that if it's early on in development and that herbicide um, has moved to that area, then maybe it could affect the seedling development. I don't know. Um, let's see. What was the next question? You're getting... Should you use Roundup in a veggie garden um, uh, to paint? Uh, can you paint brush it on? Um, and a couple of, of uh, answers on that one. Um, certain formulations of Roundup can be used in a vegetable garden. Read and follow those labels very carefully. Um, some of the, anything that it says extended control on it should not be used in a vegetable garden. Um, but yes, certainly um, you could um, take just straight up glyphosate you know, uh, certain formulations around up and paint those on the plants or brush them on very carefully and um, to minimize, you know, any potential damage to surrounding plants. But yes, that could be done. What effect does preen have on earthworms? That is a good question. I do not know the answer to that. Um, there used to be, and I bet there still is, uh, there was a website I think it was just preen.com that had a long list of um, questions and answers. And I would say look there. Um, they might have that, that issue addressed there. And if not, you can post the question. 
Okay, and I think I've answered all the questions um, that I see on the instant message. Um, if I'm missing anything, let me know.